This video is going to be about the Cartesian product. Uh, first, we're going to define vectors or tuples, as some people say, and provide some uh, simple examples just to get the idea going. We're going to use the definition of vector in order to define Cartesian product. Um, and then we'll provide two and a half, I don't know, two and a half examples of the Cartesian product at the end to try to make the idea just a little bit more tangible. So off we go. First, we're going to define vector or tuple. They're just synonyms. A vector is a collection of numbers. So this is immediately different than a set, since sets can be any kind of noun. And this is specifically a collection of numbers, which are enclosed in parentheses. This is really just kind of how we write them. And elements separated by commas. So this is just kind of one, here's a quick example, object that captures two numbers. So we just write one comma two. I think we've seen some notation like this before. This is a, um, yeah, let's just get rid of all that, a vector of length two or a two tuple, as some people say. Let's do another example. It doesn't have to be length two. It doesn't have to be in order. We could have 2.1, 0 0.9, 7, and 80. That's really nasty. 8, 88. Why not? This is a four tuple. If you're looking to say the object and its length in one go, uh, tuple is a friendly definition, but I tend to use vector more often. So theoretically, you could have any old numbers you want, and you could have up to n of them. And this would just be a vector of length n. And I don't really care what those numbers a1 up to a n are. Uh, we're going to ignore for now the possibility of vectors of infinite length. So we'll stick to vectors with a finite number of elements in them. So that wasn't so bad. We're going to use this definition of a vector to define Cartesian product. So here we go, Cartesian product. V. Cartesian product of two sets is defined as, so let's just say we have two sets and we'll use X to denote our Cartesian product. This is just no fancy X, this is any old X. Uh, maybe like you used to write multiplication, but now when it operates on two sets, we, it is the binary operation, the Cartesian product. So the Cartesian product, written out like this, is defined as the one set of vectors of length two with elements that come from each of the sets we are acting on. So all we're really saying is that each AI comes from the set capital AI for I in well, since we only had the sets A1 and A2, the index I just goes for 1 and 2. But you can imagine that we can define the Cartesian product against, uh, it doesn't have to be two sets, some number of sets. So we could say for five sets, we'd get A1 cross A2 cross all the way up to A5. And indeed, what we get out then are vectors of length five, such that each AI comes from the enclosing set capital AI for I in 
however many sets you have, as long as you've named them like I have. So let's just generalize this a little bit. For n sets, we can shorten this notation here by just saying we have a product from i equals 1 to little n of all the sets a i. And as you might guess, this is just then a set of ve vectors of length n, where each a i comes from the set capital a i for i in 1 to n. So there is our most general definition of a Cartesian product. It is essentially just a way to combine sets into a new set such that you get an element of each of the sets paired up with each element of each every other set. Okay, I think um, if you are used to a standard deck of 52 playing cards in the US or much of Europe, then you actually could very easily give an example of a Cartesian product. So there are suits, which we could define as the set of, let's see, we've got clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. And if you're not familiar with 52 playing cards, I highly encourage you to go look up what I'm talking about here, because A, this example will make a lot more sense, and B, standard decks of 52 playing cards show up routinely in the world of statistics, because they're so well suited to probability examples that we will uh, be playing with and solving later on. So we also have then faces as another set. And this is going to be like ace, one, two, all the way up to 10. You also have a jack, a queen, and a king. So then the deck itself is really just the set suits Cartesian product faces. And what you end up with in the end is the ace of clubs all the way up to the ace of spades. You've got the one of clubs all the way up to the one of spades. And we can continue that all the way up to the, let's see, it would be the king of spades, skipping many more cards in that set. But hopefully this gives you an idea of we're essentially just combining ace with each of the suits. And for each face, we're combining each of the suits all the way up to the last of both of the elements, the king of spades. Okay, so that's my first example. My second example is like a plane of real numbers. And in fact, this is such a common space that they denote it R2. And so all we're really doing is creating Let's see, it'll help if I get a straight line out of here. Is creating basically from the standard space you use to make a plot. We're just going to have ticks along here. And I don't know, they're just going to denote one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. I'm not going to draw that many on the y-axis, on the x2 axis, two, three, four. So here we go. This point right here can be represented as 1, 1. 
And this point right here, uh, give or take some, can be represented as 4, 3. So all we're essentially doing, if you consider this whole space such that x2 extends off to infinity, x1 extends off to infinity, x2 extends off to negative infinity, and x1 extends off to negative infinity, r2 is essentially just the real numbers cross the real numbers, and it's equal to the set of x1 and x2, vectors of length 2, where each of the x's comes from the real numbers, for i in 1 and 2. So essentially, we've just created a plane, a flat surface representing all the points in the space, where you can take each element in the first set of real numbers and connect it with each element of the real numbers, but thought of as a second set of the real numbers. So you can create this entire grid of points laid out in front of you. There's an infinite number of ticks in between each of these integers and so forth. We call that the plane of real numbers. That is represented by r squared, because then we're just kind of doing some sort of play on the Cartesian product idea. And in fact, this works for really kind of any dimension you want. So you could think of that plane being extended out from your computer screen into the space in front of you, and you might get some sort of like cube-like space. Well, that's just from r cross r three times. That's equal to the set of vectors of length three such that each xi comes from r for i in 1, 2, and 3. So it's like each r here for each new i is thought of as like an independent copy of the real numbers. You're essentially pulling all the elements from independent copies of the real numbers. And if you extend this down, you can imagine that there is indeed an n-dimensional real number space where you just have elements in this space that are uh, vectors of length n. It's a little crazy to think about because we even struggle to visualize this kind of space in three dimensions. But indeed, in the world of math, it lives up into n dimensions, where each element of this n-dimensional space is a vector of length n. So early on, when I gave you a vector of length 5, I was essentially describing r in the fifth dimensional space. So hopefully that gives us a good understanding of Cartesian products. We're going to see many more examples in the future of this idea because it comes up quite a bit in the world of statistics.